Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. One of the most skin-crawling stories about Mel's Hole details the fate of a sheep that Mel Waters claims to have lowered into the pit as one of the many experiments he conducted. The sheep, like Mel's dogs and other local animals, was absolutely terrified of the pit and Mel had to tranquilize it in order to get it close enough to the mouth of the hole. Curious after hearing about the strange fate of a bucket of ice that apparently became warm and flammable after being lowered into a similar hole, Mel decided to do the same thing with the sheep. What happened to the sheep, though, was even stranger. When Mel hoisted the sheep back up out of the hole, it was dead, and it appeared to have been cooked from the inside. Even stranger was that something appeared to be moving inside it, and when it was cut open, Mel saw something that he described as resembling a fetal seal with human eyes staring back at him. He immediately threw the creature back into the hole. When he told the story to curious neighbors, some said that they too had seen a similar creature around the hole before. Whatever it is, it may be the only thing that can get in and out of Mel's hole. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Welcome, weirdos. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear other podcasts that I host, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the Weird Darkness. One January afternoon in 1897, Erasmus, or Edward Shue, a blacksmith, sent his neighbor's young boy to see if Elva Shue's wife of three months needed anything from the market. When the neighbor boy walked through the front door of the Shue's rural Greenbrier County, West Virginia log house, he found Elva's lifeless body at the foot of the stairs. The boy stood for a moment, looking at the woman not knowing what to make of the scene. Her body was stretched out straight with her legs together. One arm was at her side and the other rested across her chest. Her head was tilted to one side. At first, he thought the woman was simply asleep on the floor. He stepped toward her, quietly calling, Mrs. Shu. When she didn't respond, he panicked and bolted from the house. He told his mother what he had found and she summoned the local doctor and coroner, George W. Knapp. Knapp didn't get to the Shoe's house for almost an hour. By the time he arrived, Shoe had already gotten home, carried his wife's body up to the bedroom, washed and dressed her, and laid her out on the bed. He'd prepared her body for burial in a high-necked dress with a stiff collar and placed a veil over her face. Knapp went about examining the body, Shu cradling his wife's head and crying the whole time. When Knapp attempted to examine Elva's neck and head, Shu became agitated. Knapp didn't want to provoke him any further, so he left. He found nothing amiss with the body parts he'd examined and had also been treating Elva for a few weeks prior, so he listed the cause of death as everlasting faint, 
and then changed it to complications from pregnancy. Elva's body was taken to her childhood home of Little Sewell Mountain and buried, but not before a bizarre funeral where her widower acted erratically. He paced by the casket, fiddling with Elva's head and neck. In addition to the collar and the veil, he covered her head and neck with a scarf. It didn't match her burial dress, but Shu insisted that it was her favorite and that she would have wanted to be buried in it. He also propped her head up, first with a pillow and then a rolled-up cloth. It was certainly strange, but most guests likely chalked it up to the grieving process. Shu was generally liked and regarded without suspicion by everyone in town. Everyone that is except Mary Jane Heaster, Elva's mother. She had never liked Shu, and even without evidence, she was convinced that he had murdered her daughter. If only Elva could tell her what happened, she thought. She decided to pray for Elva to somehow come back from the dead and reveal the truth about her death. She prayed every evening for weeks, until finally her prayer was answered. Easter claimed her daughter appeared to her in a dream four nights in a row to tell her story. Supposedly, the spirit appeared first as a bright light, gradually taking a human form and filling the room with a chill. Elva's ghost confessed to her mother that Shu cruelly abused her, and one night attacked her in a rage when she thought that she hadn't made any meat for his dinner. He had broken her neck, the ghost said, as it turned its head completely around. Then the ghost turned and walked away, disappearing into the night while staring back at her mother. Easter went to the local prosecutor, John Preston, and spent the afternoon at his office trying to get him to reopen the case. Whether Preston believed her story about the ghost, we don't know, but Easter was persistent and convincing enough that he began asking questions around town. Shu's neighbors and friends told Preston about the man's strange behavior at the funeral, and Dr. Knapp admitted that his examination had been incomplete. It was enough for Preston to justify an order for a complete autopsy, and a few days later, the body was exhumed despite Shu's objections. Knapp and two other doctors laid the body out in the town's one-room schoolhouse to give it a thorough examination. A local newspaper, the Pocahontas Times, later reported that on the throat were the marks of fingers indicating that she had been choking, that the neck was dislocated between the first and second vertebra, the ligaments were torn and ruptured, the windpipe had been crushed at a point in the front of the neck. It was clear Elva's death was not natural, but there was no evidence pointing to the killer and no witnesses. Shu's strange behavior since Elva's death stuck in Preston's mind and cast some suspicion on him. At the same time, Elva's mother had described exactly how her daughter was killed before the autopsy was performed. Maybe she had done it, and the ghost story was an elaborate plot to frame Shu. Preston continued to investigate and began looking into Shu's past. He learned that Shu had been married twice before. The first ended in divorce while Shu was in prison for stealing a horse. That wife later told police that Shu was extremely violent and beat her frequently while they were married. His second marriage ended after just eight months with the mysterious death of his wife. In between these marriages, Shu boasted in prison that he planned to marry seven women in his lifetime. The previous wife's mysterious death and Shu's history of abuse were circumstantial but enough for Preston to bring him to trial. Mary Jane Heaster was the prosecution's star witness, but Preston wanted to avoid the issue of her ghostly sightings since Elva's story as relayed by her mother might be objected to as hearsay by the defense. Perhaps hoping to prove her unreliable, Shu's lawyer questioned Heaster extensively about the ghost's visits on cross-examination. The tactic backfired with Heaster refusing to waver in her account despite intense badgering by the lawyer. Many people in the community, if not the jury, seemed to believe Heaster's story, and Shu did himself no favors taking the stand in his own defense, 
rambling and appealing to the jury to look into his face and then say if he was guilty. The Greenbrier Independent reported that his testimony, manner, and so forth made an unfavorable impression on the spectators. The jury deliberated for just an hour and ten minutes before returning a guilty verdict. True was sentenced to life in prison, but died soon after as epidemics of measles and pneumonia tore through the prison in the spring of 1900. Mrs. Heaster lived until 1916 and never recanted her story about Elva's ghost. Maybe her story swayed the jury and won the case. Maybe it didn't. Maybe her daughter spoke to her from beyond the grave. Maybe the ghost was all in Heaster's head, or maybe it was a strategic lie. But no matter who saw or believed what, without the ghost story, Heaster may have never gone to Preston, and Shu might not have gone to trial. A historical marker in Greenbrier County commemorates Elva's death and the unusual court case that followed, noting that this was the only known case in which testimony from a ghost helped convict a murderer. You're listening to a Weird Darkness Darkives episode, where I reach back to share an episode with you from years past. If my voice sounds different in this episode, it's because the recordings are older, my presentation style was different, and my voice has naturally gotten lower over the years. For some of you, this will be a nice blast from the past. For others, it'll be new to you with stories you've not yet heard me tell. My goal now is to bring you new episodes of Weird Darkness every Monday through Friday as best I can, and also post a Dark Archives episode, or Darkives episode, every day of the week as well. I hope you enjoy the new schedule. So many weird things happen in the Pacific Northwest that, comparatively, a mysterious hole in the ground seems pretty innocuous. At first. Next to numerous Bigfoot sightings and miles of giant mushrooms, the phenomenon of Mel's Hole seems pretty straightforward, until you realize that it also happens to be a bottomless pit that brings animals back from the dead. Mel's Hole is one of the most mysterious places in the state of Washington. The mystery of Mel's Hole all started with an interview on Coast to Coast AM radio when a caller, identifying himself as Mel Waters, claimed that he found a real-life bottomless pit on his property. As you can imagine, things only got creepier from there. Pet Cemetery Creepy Today, this supernatural phenomenon in Washington, like so many others, straddles the line between being famous and elusive. Curious? Unnerved, both? If supernatural entertainment intrigues you, keep listening for more facts about Mel's Hole, its rise to notoriety, and the bizarre secrets said to hide somewhere in its bottomless depths. Though Mel Waters, if he ever existed at all, is credited with having brought attention to the pit, the legend itself began long before he came around. Local residents, authorities, and indigenous tribes knew of the hole for decades before Waters ever bought the property. As the story goes, the pit was about nine feet in diameter, with walls constructed out of hand-placed bricks stretching 15 feet down before transitioning into dirt and darkness. Known popularly as the Devil's Hole, the locals all agreed that there was something rather unsettling about the hole's existence. But no one cared, nor wanted, to think too hard about what that something might be. Manistash Ridge residents instead used the hole as a garbage dump and decided not to question the eerie fact that the pit never appeared to fill up. According to Waters' interview with Coast to Coast AM host Art Bell, once Waters realized that the hole wasn't showing any signs of filling up, he decided to test it. His plan was to bring thousands of feet of fishing line and a sturdy fishing rod out to the hole, 
add weight to the fishing line and then measure how far down it went before hitting the bottom. By the end of his test, Waters got more than he bargained for. The hole had no bottom. And if a bottom does exist, it's deep enough that the weighted line failed to go slack after 80,000 feet. Neither Waters nor anyone else has ever confirmed reaching the bottom. People who have been brave enough to approach the pit all noticed something peculiar about the area's wildlife, or more aptly, the lack thereof. Animals obviously hated the hole and would do their best to stay as far away from it as possible. Waters even reported that his own dogs refused to approach the hole. When he tried to bring them closer to it, they dug their paws into the ground in protest. Other visitors even took note of the fact that birds avoided flying directly over it, and no other small animals ever appeared near it. According to various reports, the only sign of wildlife were piles of bones strewn around the mouth of the pit. After Waters allegedly lowered 80,000 feet of fishing line into the hole on his property to try and locate the bottom, he suspected that there might be something more sinister about the hole than its infinite depth. Waters began performing a variety of other tests in an attempt to better understand this seemingly endless pit. When he yelled directly into the pit, he heard silence instead of an echo. And if he brought a handheld radio near the hole, it would play music that sounded decades out of date. Further tests were conducted at a location known as the Second Devil's Hole, a pit in Nevada believed to have properties identical to those of the Washington Hole. When a bucket of ice was lowered about 1,500 feet down into the hole, the ice had changed by the time it was brought back up. It felt inexplicably warm, seemed to dry out the air near it, and even became flammable. Mel Waters' interview with Art Bell on Coast to Coast AM brought the hole into public consciousness, and one of the stories he told during the call was absolutely chilling. According to Mel, locals have used the hole to get rid of anything from old equipment to dead cattle, but apparently throwing something down the hole didn't guarantee that it would stay there. During the interview, Mel claimed that when one of the neighbor's dogs passed away, his neighbor brought the dog to the hole to get rid of it. The neighbor then allegedly told Mel that, after he'd done so, he later saw his dog running in the forest, alive and well, and still wearing the collar that had been around its neck when its body had been brought to the hole. One of the most skin-crawling stories about Mel's hole details the fate of a sheep that Mel Waters claims to have lowered into the pit as one of the many experiments he conducted. The sheep, like Mel's dogs and other local animals, was absolutely terrified of the pit and Mel had to tranquilize it in order to get it close enough to the mouth of the hole. Curious after hearing about the strange fate of a bucket of ice that apparently became warm and flammable after being lowered into a similar hole, Mel decided to do the same thing with the sheep. What happened to the sheep, though, was even stranger. When Mel hoisted the sheep back up out of the hole, it was dead, and it appeared to have been cooked from the inside. Even stranger was that something appeared to be moving inside it, and when it was cut open, Mel saw something that he described as resembling a fetal seal with human eyes staring back at him. He immediately threw the creature back into the hole. When he told the story to curious neighbors, some said that they too had seen a similar creature around the hole before. Whatever it is, it may be the only thing that can get in and out of Mel's hole. Mel Waters' property in Washington is home to the original pit that spawned the legend, but it's not the only one. Another hole is said to exist in Nevada that displays properties very similar to those attributed to the original Mel's hole. According to Mel, he has visited the second hole as well, and it's every bit as bizarre and fascinating as the one found on his property. Birds of an unidentifiable species have been seen circling the Nevada pit, and when Mel attempted to shoot one down for study, he found that the bullets seemed to ricochet right off of them. If bulletproof birds are any indication, 
the Nevada hole is likely hiding just as many supernatural secrets as Mel's. The alleged interaction between Mel Waters and the U.S. government, if true, means that Mel's hole is more important than even Mel himself realized. According to Mel's story, government agents attempted to prevent him from entering his own property, claiming that a plane had crashed there. When he refused to believe their story, they abruptly switched tactics and offered to lease his land from him for $250,000 on one condition. If he accepted, he would have to leave the country. Mel, being in dire straits at the time, accepted. He then moved to Australia and didn't return for several years. When he did, government agents insisted that they had bought his land. Locals then informed Mel that the area around the pit had been guarded by black vans and helicopters since he left. After Mel Waters' first interview on Coast to Coast AM, no one had any reason to question his identity. Then his story started to strike a chord. Coast to Coast listeners were enthralled by stories of the pit, so Mel decided to give a second interview. But, paradoxically, the more Mel stepped into the spotlight, the more interesting he and his story seemed to become. He'd been featured on Coast to Coast AM several times before followers of the story began to search local records for his name in hopes of determining the exact location of the hole, and they found nothing. No property transfers had been conducted in the area during the time that Mel claimed to have sold the land to the government, and no one named Mel Waters had voted, paid taxes, or even lived there. Whether Mel was a hoax or a pseudonym, Mel Waters was ultimately consumed by the mystery of the whole himself. Among the Coast to Coast AM listeners who took an interest in the story of Mel's hole was a geologist named Jack Powell. After hearing Mel describe the characteristics of the pit on the radio, Powell thought he recognized the hole as being an abandoned mine shaft that he was familiar with from his childhood. But when Mel revealed that he had lowered at least 80,000 feet of fishing line into the hole in order to test its depth, Powell realized that the story was much stranger than he had thought. A hole that deep would not be physically possible. Based on Powell's geological expertise, this can only mean that Mel Waters designed a spectacular hoax, or that among the many mysteries presented by Mel's hole is a localized geographical anomaly. Anyone who is level-headed is going to have a tough time believing that there is a huge half-man, half-moth creature going around terrorizing a small town in Chicago. However, according to many people, this is exactly what happened during 2017 when there were 55 sightings of the creature. It seems that the Mothman started appearing to residents of a small town in 1966 to warn about an upcoming catastrophe relating to the collapse of a bridge in the town of Point Pleasant, West Virginia. The story about the strange creature was told by John Keel in the novel with the title of The Mothman Prophecies and it was then made into a movie starring Richard Gere. Now the Mothman creature has started to turn up in Chicago, and there have been numerous reports of the creature. A Fortean researcher, Lon Strickler, has compiled the sightings on his website, and he also wrote a book by the name of The Mothman Dynasty. The book takes a look at all of the sightings of the Mothman ever since the latter half of the 1970s. The new sightings of the Mothman started in February of 2017, and since that time Strickler has spent many hours interviewing witnesses who have claimed to have seen the Mothman and documented their stories. John Amitrano is one of the people who claimed that he saw the Mothman. Amitrano said that he was working late one night in a hangout in Chicago that was popular and he then went outside and saw something that he found difficult to explain. He said that he had seen a plane flying in the sky but there was something moving underneath it, very awkwardly. 
He said that it took on the appearance of what pterodactyls look like in illustrations, with a head that was slender and wings. He said that he did not think it was a bat or bird, as it did not have feathers or fur and did not fly like a bat or bird or anything he could think of. He said that the creature had legs that were muscular, a human-like shape, and the creature flew in a motion that was strange, swooping down and then undulating up and then back down. The sightings by Amatrano is just one of the 55 sightings that have taken the place of the Mothman in the Chicago region during 2017. Many of the reports have been the Mothman flying in the sky. However, there have been accounts by some people of the creature landing on the tops of vehicles and swooping down out of the sky onto people. Stickler said the group sightings of the Mothman are historical in cryptozoology terms. He went on to say, for one, it's happening in a region that is urban, and there have been so many sightings all at once. Strickler said that he uses the West Virginia Mothman sightings from the 1960s as a reference point, and he went on to say that he does not think that the creature in Chicago is warning residents of an impending disaster. He went on to say that the beings are not as aggressive as the one that was appearing in Point Pleasant. He went on to say that he thought overall there had only been one creature in the Point Pleasant region seen during the period. Psychologist Dr. David A. Gallo from the University of Chicago has undertaken research into memory and more so with how people actively reconstruct the past, sometimes inaccurately, and he does not think that the sightings are what Strickler is making them out to be. He went on to say that it was a selective sample, and when people choose to report the sightings, the basis of data on which the paranormal researchers collect is self-report. This means that Strickler is not sampling random people to ask if they have seen the Mothman, he's only counting those who came forward and reported having seen the creature. Gallo went on to say that he does not deny that the people who claim to have seen the Mothman have seen something that they cannot explain. He said that there is a phenomenon where people have witnessed something, and he went on to say that if there are gaps or holes in that experience, the mind is often not able to fill in the gaps. Gallo pointed out that if something had been suggested to them as being a scenario that is plausible, like there being a Mothman, the person might fill the gaps with that scenario. For now, the Mothman remains something of a mystery. Perhaps people did see a strange, moth-like creature as big as a man, or perhaps their minds just told them they did. Swinging open the front gate of Brompton Cemetery is a bit like cracking the spine of a book detailing London history. Famous suffragist Emmeline Pankhurst rests here. Beatrix Potter strolled its 39 acres and plucked names from tombstones to use in her work, including descendants Peter Rabbit and Mr. Nutkins. More than 35,000 monuments in all are present, rich and poor, known and obscure. In the middle of the grounds and shrouded by trees stands a mausoleum, an imposing 20 feet tall with a pyramid peak. It's made from granite with a heavy bronze door secured by a keyhole. Decorative accents line the front, furthering the air of mystery. The door's margin displays a rectangular band of Egyptian hieroglyphs. Erected in the early 1850s, it was intended as the final resting place of a woman named Hannah Cordoy and two of her three daughters, Mary and Elizabeth. Cordoy's tomb would be remarkable for its imposing stature and cryptic veneer alone. It is the largest, most elaborate construction in Brompton Cemetery. But there is more to the story. For the many visitors who make moonlit visits to the cemetery and for a small band of Londoners, the tomb's missing key and resulting lack of access has led to speculation that something strange is going on inside, that it is secretly a time machine. It's a fantastic notion, but one that London musician and Courtois historian Stephen Coates is quick to dismiss. It's not a time machine, he tells Mental Floss, it's a teleportation chamber. 
in order to try and digest the bizarre urban legend that has been constructed around Cordoy's tomb, it helps to understand the highly controversial life of the woman who ordered its construction. Born around 1784 – sources differ on that – Hannah Peters fled an abusive father at a young age and found work as a housekeeper and as a tavern employee. In 1800, a friend introduced her to John Cordoy, a 70-year-old former wig maker in poor health who had made a fortune in the lending business. Peters was shortly in his employ as a housekeeper. Within the year, she had given birth to the first of three daughters. She claimed they were Cordoy's, although some eyes were raised in suspicion that the friend who made the introduction, Francis Grosso, might have been the real father. Cordoy's illness is also ill-defined in historical accounts, although it was said to follow a violent run-in with a prostitute in 1795 that left Cordoy, who had been slashed at with a knife, reserved and antisocial. He apparently warmed to Peters, who took his name and exerted considerable influence over many of his decisions. Cordoy's 1810 will, which left the bulk of his fortune to an ex-wife named Mary Ann Woolley and their five children, was revised in 1814, so Hannah received the majority share. When Cordoy died in 1818, the contents of the will were disputed, both by Woolley and Cordoy's French relatives. They argued that dementia had overtaken Cordoy's better senses. The legal arguments dragged on through 1827, at which point Hannah and her daughters had received most of Cordoy's money. According to the account presented in author David Godson's 2014 book, Cordoy's Complaint, largely based on diaries kept by Cordoy housekeeper Maureen Sayers, Hannah's urge to distract herself from the often unpleasant Cordoy led to developing a friendship that would prove essential to her later mythology. Like many Victorians of the era, Hannah was intrigued by Egyptian iconography, particularly hieroglyphics. She believed Egyptians had a deep understanding of astrology and their place in the universe, and she invited Egyptologist Joseph Bonamy over for regular visits. Bonamy and Hannah would spend hours discussing Egyptian lore, with Hannah hoping to one day fund Bonamy's expeditions to Egypt so he could study their work. The two would also arrange for a 175-foot-tall monument dedicated to the Duke of Wellington to be constructed and insisted that the sculpture resemble an Egyptian obelisk. When Hannah died in 1849, her remains were set to be placed in an expensive, elaborate mausoleum in Brompton that paid tribute to her interests. Bonamy arranged for the tomb to feature Egyptian characters and a pyramidal top. Later, Mary and Elizabeth, who shied from marriage because they didn't want men chasing after their wealth, joined her. Susanna, who did marry, was buried elsewhere. When Bonamy died in 1878, he arranged for a depiction of Cordoy's tomb to appear on his own modest headstone. Whether Bonamy intended it or not, an illustration of Anubis, the Egyptian god of the dead, appears to be looking in the direction of his friend's final resting place. Things appeared to remain status quo at Brompton for the next 100 years or so. Then, around 1980, the key to the tomb was lost following a visit by Hannah's relatives, and that is when things took a turn for the weird. Intending to pique the interest of readers during Halloween, Associated Press reporter Helen Smith wrote a story in October 1998 that may have been the first mainstream article to raise the theory that Cordoy's tomb might actually be a time machine. Smith described the monument as a strange, imposing structure containing three spinsters, about whom almost nothing is known, and cited an unheralded author named Howard Webster as perpetuator of the story. Webster claimed his research had excavated a connection between Bonamy and Samuel Alfred Warner, a maverick Victorian genius and fraudster, said to have attempted to interest the British armed forces in several advanced weapons, too advanced, in fact, to actually exist. Webster speculated that Warner's inventive abilities may have led him to consort with Bonamy, who supposedly had knowledge of the Egyptian theories of time travel. Together, the two convinced the wealthy, trusting Hannah to finance their secret project, 
with Bonamy providing ancient wisdom and Warner adding his breakthrough scientific resources. By placing their device in a cemetery, Warner could guarantee the structure was unlikely to be disturbed over decades or centuries, allowing him to return to London after traveling through time again and again. The lack of a key was crucial to Webster's tale. Since it had been lost and no one had been inside for years, it could be argued that perhaps Warner was busying himself in a manner similar to an occupant of the TARDIS, bouncing from era to era, while Hannah and her family were either entombed or buried someplace else entirely. Webster also claimed that the plans for the tomb were missing, which was rarely the case with other monuments in Brompton. The story bubbled to the surface periodically over the years. In 2003, an album cover by musician Drew Mulholland depicted the tomb and its eerie structure, which led to some renewed interest. In 2011, Coates, a musician with a band named The Real Tuesday Weld, came across mention of the theory and was intrigued. He wrote a post on his blog positing that the Cordoy tomb was not a means of time travel but that Warner had the technology to teleport torpedoes and that he later adopted that framework to develop a series of teleportation chambers in and around the Magnificent Seven, a group of London's historic private cemeteries. It was a way to move around the city, Coates says. Warner and Bonamy worked together on ancient Egyptian occult theory and science. I posted it on my blog and it started to take on a life of its own. Coates' premise is a proper study in how an urban legend can proliferate. With the key still missing, it was impossible to disprove the teleportation idea with any real precision, and the mythology allowed for a great deal of speculation. Was Warner, who died in 1848, killed because he knew too much about revolutionary technology? Why did the tomb take four years to complete following Hannah's death, which meant she didn't actually enter it until 1853? Was Hannah duped by the two to fund what she might have believed would be a pioneering mode of travel? It became, Coates says, one of the myths of the city. In 2015, The Independent ran a feature describing his belief, contrasting it with the activities of Hannah Cordoy descendant Ray Godson, who simply wanted access to the tomb to pay his respects to his great-great-grandmother. The feature came just as Coates was busy organizing visitor groups that could come with the cemetery's permission, hear the legend of Cordoy, Bonamy, and Warner while standing near the tomb in the middle of the night. I fell in love with the idea. Vanessa Wolf, a professional storyteller based in London who hosts the gatherings, tells Mental Floss. I must credit Stephen Coates. I contacted him after hearing about the myth and told him I really wanted to tell the story. He said to go for it. Wolf hosted the first event in 2015 and has done several more since. The first time we were absolutely overwhelmed with bookings, she says. In the story presentation, Wolf tells of a barking mad inventor named Warner who connects with Bonamy and hatches an idea for a teleportation network. Hannah, she relates, had an interest in the occult and unexplained phenomena. There's a huge interest in the story in London, she says. I think people are just interested in the fabric of places where they live. This is a story rooted in the secret, in the occult, but no one is quite sure what actually happened. It can be difficult to corner Coates for a precise answer on whether he believes his fanciful hypothesis about the resting place of Hannah Cordoy. When initially contacted for an interview, he agreed while mentioning that he came up with the whole teleportation system idea as the background to a short story. In conversation, he presented the teleportation springboard as a way for people to make up their own mind about what the tomb might contain. A breath or two later, he expresses doubt that Hannah's daughters might still be entombed there, before wondering whether the mausoleum might be home to a secret subterranean chamber. It's all alternative theory based on historical fact, he says. Reached by telephone, it's hard not to imagine a slight expression of amusement crossing his face. Performance art or not, the attention has increased awareness over the cemetery's attempts to secure funds for a site-wide renovation. Cordai's tomb was partially spruced up in 2009 following aging, cross-coated chunks of granite sloughing off the side with costs partially covered by a family trust. 
When asked to comment on whether the midnight vigils and sightseers have been disruptive, Brompton officials refer questions right back to Coates, who appears to have become their unofficial spokesman on all things involving molecular disruption and Egyptian time hopping. It's not something they promote themselves, Coates says. They're very welcoming of people who come if they're showing respect. The conservation efforts have been going on for years and the events help that. At the last Coates arranged show, tickets went for eight to ten dollars with a quarter of the proceeds donated to the cemetery's rebuilding efforts. How many people will visit once a key is made? That's another question. Both Coates and a Brompton Cemetery historian named Arthur Tate say that efforts are currently underway to fabricate a replacement that would allow Hannah's relatives access to the tomb. After an initial flush of curiosity, wouldn't the presumably ordinary interior dampen interest? Opening it may not establish it's not a time machine, Coates hedges, it may just deepen the mystery. For Wolf, who still has regular engagements hosting visitors near the tomb, seeing a key may be a letdown. It's much nicer in a way not having it, she says. It's really all in the minds of the audience. It's a slab of rock. The real magic is in their minds. Usually, while Wolf normally gets very positive notices from those attending her performances, one reviewer on Instagram does stick out. It said something like, Oh, I was really excited, but then I got really disappointed. She didn't even open it. If you like what you're hearing on Weird Darkness, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find information on sponsors you heard during the show, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, find other podcasts that I host. You can visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. And if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell of your own, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. The bathroom tile was cold under Lucy's bare feet as she peered into the medicine cabinet mirror, partially reconsidering the decision she'd made the day before. She ran her fingers through her shaggy pixie cut, nary a hair pointing in the same direction. The stylist had cut a full 16 inches of pristine, dark blonde locks for donation to charity, and Lucy could not be happier with her new carefree, playful style. It was the decision to bleach and then change her color to a vibrant aqua blue that had her second guessing herself. She loved the color and was fortunate that her employer did not place any limitations on self-expression. So long as she wore black jeans with no holes in them and the company provided t-shirt, the owners of the Sacred Bean knew that an interesting and confident waitstaff would only make the coffee drinking experience more memorable for their patrons. She loved the confidence boost and the smiles that had greeted her on the street as she walked home. But most of all, she loved the grimace of disapproval she'd received from Edith, the elderly lady two doors down from her as they passed in the hallway of their apartment building. It was just a lot of change in a short amount of time. She loved it, but it would still take some getting used to. After having long hair for so many years, she had learned how to use it to her advantage if she did not want to be seen, how to disappear on the subway or in a crowded store. Now there was nowhere to hide, no cover. Not only had she revealed herself to the world, but she had purposely chosen a color that was sure to draw the eye of anyone she passed if they liked it or not. Lucy splashed some water on her face and rubbed her damp hands through her hair, ruffling it up even further. The occasional drip was chilly on her bare shoulders and chest. Her tank top and boxer shorts were going out of season. 
Her cool weather clothes would need to come out of storage soon. Just as she started to leave the bathroom, a tickle between her shoulder blades gave her a fright. Her irrational first instinct was some insidious spider had somehow crawled into her bed and then her shirt for warmth. She yanked her shirt over her head and vigorously shook it, watching to see if anything fell to the floor. But there was nothing. She sighed in relief and looked the shirt over just in case. Embedded in the threads of the tank top was a single auburn hair. She carefully pulled the winding hair from the shirt and held it in front of her. It was about five inches long and appeared to be color-treated, judging by the silvery root at the end. Ugh, she groaned, dropping it in the wastebasket. Nobody she knew had that color of hair, and even if they did, how would one of their hairs get woven into the fabric of the tank she only wore to sleep in? Nasty laundromat machines. Lucy dismissed the oddity, having no spare time to devote to something so inconsequential. The morning rush was always the busiest time at the sacred bean, and today was the last day she would want to be late. Her hair would already be getting enough attention. A sick co-worker calling out meant pulling a double shift and tired feet. Lucy was exhausted. She dragged through the door with a bag of fast food in tow, pausing to check her hair in the small decorative mirror that hung near the door. Thankfully, the new hairstyle had held up, unnoticeably different from when she'd left for work that morning. Lucy smiled at herself, finally certain she had made the right decision. The greasy burger and salty fries seemed to take the edge off her nerves, warming her belly just before the frozen sweetness of the milkshake washed everything down. But after the day she had had, it would take a little more than a milkshake for her to relax. There was a bottle of cheap whiskey and a two-liter of Coke in the fridge that was calling her name. That would be more than enough to do the trick. Settled in on the couch, drink in hand, she kicked off her shoes before propping her feet on the coffee table, careful not to knock over any of her dinner trash. Scanning her surroundings for the TV remote was fruitless, as was feeling under the couch. She regretfully knew the next course of action. Her face scrunched in disgust as she slid her hand between the couch cushions, brushing into every forgotten crumb and used tissue. Finally, she located the remote and drew it up from the darkness triumphantly. Her celebration was short-lived. Much to her disgust and confusion, several long, reddish hairs were stuck to her hand and the remote. That's disgusting, she grumbled as she pulled the hairs from the remote and her hand before gathering them into a ball. Thinking back to the morning, she returned to the bathroom and sat the wastebasket on the sink. There, laying right on top of the emptied tube of toothpaste, was the single hair she had pulled from her shirt, trapped like a prehistoric insect in amber. Lucy carefully pulled it free of its minty trap and compared it to the hairball taken from the couch. The color was exact, and although the length was unable to be compared, she could see the roots at the end were the same. The same amount of natural, silvery roots was visible at the end of each of the hairs. Their owner had lost them at the same time. Lucy grabbed a few squares of toilet paper and placed her strange collection on one end before folding the other side over it and then folded it double. Returning to the couch, she was unable to focus on the show that was playing instead staring off into space, trying to make sense of her discoveries. Considering that she often fell asleep on the couch, it was possible her shirt had picked up the hair and embedded into the weave of the fabric as she wiggled in her sleep. Her conclusion only led to a more complicated question. If she had gotten the hair in her shirt from sleeping on the couch, how did the hairs get inside her couch? Lucy woke the next morning with a sore back and stinging eyes. Too much time working on concrete floors had taken its toll on her legs and back, leaving her stiff and slow. She had slept late, almost noon. The bright sun had seeped into her eyes through the lids, leaving them dry and swollen. She was thankful she had the day off, because of being worn out from the day before was not enough, she felt like she was getting sick. 
Her throat was dry and raw, and a horrid taste coated her mouth and tongue. I don't have time to be sick, she grumbled, dragging herself from the bed and toward the shower in hopes that the refreshing steam would infuse some resemblance of humanity with which she could face the day. She paused at the mirror, looking herself over. At least my hair looks good. The rest of me looks like crap. Standing under the water, as still as a statue, the pounding droplets on her scalp seemed to echo in her stuffy head and ears. She breathed in the steam, felt it creeping up her nose and into her chest. A quick tickle was followed by a couple of sharp coughs, the vapor chasing out the invading gunk from her lungs. Lucy instantly crossed her arms over her breasts, squeezing her ribcage and lungs from the outside. She rubbed her throat and attempted to clear it, which was hurting more than before, and reluctantly accepted her body was under attack. She closed her eyes, fading out to the sounds of the shower and the heartbeat she could hear echoed in her ears. Another coughing spasm was working up, and she knew it was going to be worse than the last. The water raced down her body in little rivers, traveling from her head to her feet. She shook one leg, assuming the tickle that she had felt on the back of her knee and then on her ankle was simply due to the water taking the path of least resistance. With her eyes closed, she was unable to see the red hairs that were making their way down her legs. Another burning cough sliced through her chest and upper throat, dragging with it gravels of congestion. Her stomach turned and she gagged. The thick knot of foulness that was creeping up her throat was nearly vomit-inducing. She could smell and taste her sulfurous metallic breath with each ragged cough. The bathroom felt like a sauna as she leaned against the shower wall to steady her lightheadedness, dialing back the hot water in preparation for the next wave of coughing she knew would happen any minute. She dreaded the pain, but also welcomed it, knowing that she would be rid of the disgusting mass sitting right at the base of her throat. Lucy held her chest and coughed, gasping for air in between. She crouched over, the warm water pounding on the back of her neck and shoulders. She coughed until she was certain that her throat was bleeding, but she was unable to move the phlegm adversary past the back of her throat. Then came the inevitable gag that moved the blockage on a scalding wave of bile, but not quite far enough. She crammed her fingers into her mouth, desperate for relief, and gagged again. Looking down between her feet, Lucy saw a clump of red hair, matted with sickly yellow congestion circling the drain. Horrified, she felt more hair in her mouth. Crying and nearly screaming, she raked at her tongue and loose hairs tangled around her wet fingertips. She nearly leaped from the shower, sliding on the slick floor to the sink. She grabbed the bottle of mouthwash and filled her mouth, gargling as she cried, trying not to swallow it or choke herself before she could spit it out. Desperate to rid herself of the taste, she swallowed a small sip of it. Like an industrial cleaner going down her throat, the burning rinse pushed down any remnants of the nightmare she had just experienced. She grabbed her towel, unable to stay in the bathroom a moment longer, and retreated to the bedroom. She stopped dead in her tracks in front of her bed and screamed. Tears flowed down her cheeks. Water dripped onto her shoulders and puddled around her feet. Her pillowcase and fitted sheet were covered in long red hairs. She crept closer, curiosity overriding shock and fear. The hair was distributed evenly, not in a clump. It almost looked like someone had gotten a haircut and the scraps had been swept up and sprinkled on her bed. She pulled a hair from her pillowcase, feeling the length with her fingertips, dry and brittle. At the end of the damaged strand, a silver root tip. She picked up another, and then more until she had a tiny bouquet of hairs. Each was always the same length. Each had the same amount of silver new growth. The hairs were not cut from their owner, but had fallen out. Chilled to the core and still dripping wet, Lucy quickly dressed and left the bedroom. She sat on the couch and stared at her bedroom door, huddled under a blanket. Someone other than herself needed to see, needed to validate 
what she was experiencing was real and not her imagination. She picked up her cell phone and called the one person she could trust to tell her the truth, the one person she swore she would never call again. The phone rang four times before the voicemail picked up, as she expected. I know I said I wouldn't call you again, and I'm sorry, but there is something going on in my apartment, and I'm scared. Can you please come over just this once? I'm not trying to start anything. I don't have anyone else to call. An hour later, as Lucy sat holding her phone, the sound of her door unlocking jolted her back into reality. She threw the blanket from her shoulders and rushed to the door. Tiffany still had a key. Oh my God, Tiff, thank you for coming over. Lucy's elation quickly turned to confusion when she made eye contact with the strange woman who walked into her apartment right behind her ex-girlfriend. An awkward silence was immediately present among the three women, and for a moment nobody moved or said a word. I'm sorry I wasn't expecting anyone to be with you. Tiffany quietly scanned the room, her eyes not settling on anything for long. She was tense, tightly squeezing her companion's hand. Lucy had not even considered that asking her to come back to their apartment would be difficult for her, but given how painful their breakup had been, it wasn't surprising that she was behaving strangely. I should have never got that call, Marissa. I'm so sorry I dragged you into this. No, wait, please. It's nice to meet you, Marissa. I'm Lucy. Thank you both for coming over. Lucy quickly gathered herself to extend a welcome, despite the prick in her heart. She wasn't surprised that Tiffany had already moved on, but seeing it with her own eyes was a different matter. However, her thankfulness to no longer be alone trumped the awkwardness. Both women took a seat on the couch, neither sure how to behave or what to say next. Lucy tried her best to be courteous and to hide her bruised feelings. Do either of you want a bottle of water or a soda? Tiffany bit her lip and shook her head, attempting to speak at risk of breaking into tears. I don't know if you saw me the other day at work, Lucy, but I saw you. You were working late, I guess. You cut your hair and went blue. I would have never imagined you'd do that. You looked really good. Oh, yeah, I, I just had it done a couple of days ago. I'm sorry, I haven't even brushed it today. She ruffled her disheveled hair, discreetly sniffing toward her underarm in the process. With everything going on, she'd not even considered showering, not in that bathroom. It was impossible for Tiffany to think she looked good now. You know how it is, nothing announces back on the market like an aqua blue pixie cut. Lucy cringed as she watched her ill-placed attempt at a joke fall flat. I don't understand what's going on, Lucy. I got a voicemail. It was just noise. I couldn't leave it alone, so we came over to check things out. Tiffany's voice cracked and tears welled in her eyes. She caught her breath with a whispery gasp. Lucy, do you hear me? Are you listening? Yes, Tiff, of course I hear you. I didn't mean to upset you. It's been a strange couple of days is all, she answered as she nervously ran her fingers through her hair again, leaving it flat in some places and sticking out on end in others. She sat down on the nearby ottoman that faced Tiffany and Marissa, pausing for a moment to gather her thoughts. She wanted to reach out to Tiffany, take her trembling hands in hers and kiss them, smell them, but she dared not touch her. I know this is going to sound crazy before I even start, but please just hear me out. I've started noticing these strange red hairs all over my house. The first one was in my shirt. Not so weird, right? Then I found a clump of them in my couch when I was feeling around in the cushions for the remote, and now they're all in my bed. They're still there. Come, look. Tiffany leaned close to Marissa's ear whispering to her. Finally, they walked into the bedroom and joined her by the bed, examining the evidence that was still scattered across it. Tiffany picked up the tiny bundle Lucy had gathered earlier from her pillow, presenting it to Marissa for investigation. "'Does she have a dog?' Marissa questioned. "'No, she never could have a pet because of allergies.' "'See, that's what I was telling you. It's all over it,' Lucy proclaimed, 
as Marissa looked over Tiffany's shoulder, even more disarmed than she had been in the living room. There was more. I kept it all. It all matches. Lucy searched over every surface, but to her frustration, she could not locate the folded squares of toilet paper that had held the hair from her shirt and the tangle from the couch. Tiffany seemed bothered by her prowling, so she stopped and rejoined them at the bed. I can't find them now, but they were all the same. I don't know anyone with this hair color. Tiff, you know that. So how did it get everywhere? Marissa questioned, obviously harboring some doubt. I don't know. Tiffany wiped her hands on her jeans as if they were dirty and crossed her arms around her waist. It doesn't look like hers. Where are they coming from? I don't know, Marissa. That's the thing. None of this makes sense to me. The three women walked around the room, looking at the ceiling, the floor, the bed, trying to figure out a connection. Tiffany noticed a strip of snapshots from a photo booth pressed into the crack between the dresser's mirror and glass frame. She took the photographs and placed them in her purse. Yeah, sure, you can have that. The only thing stranger than what she'd been experiencing was Tiffany's behavior. They moved out from the bedroom and through the rest of the house. When they entered the kitchen, Lucy instantly felt embarrassed. The whole area was no less than three weeks overdue for a cleaning. The sink was full, mostly dirty cereal bowls filled with murky water that released a foul odor as they passed. The trash was overflowing, fast food cups spilling onto the floor. They quickly left the room and returned to the living room. Tiffany looked around and rubbed her face, her gaze settling on Lucy, but improperly. Lucy realized that her former love could no longer bring herself to look her in the eye. Lucy, I... I can't keep going on like this. This isn't going to help. I don't understand. A priest or a therapist. Heck, maybe even an exorcist would know what to do, but I don't. I just know that I need to let go. I'm trying to. We tried, Lucy, but we weren't meant to be. We, we both have to accept that. That's not what this is, Lucy rebounded, embarrassed and hurt. She was at the salon just a couple of days ago, getting all her hair cut off, and then magically there's hair all over the house. How are we not supposed to think this is connected? Some sick joke. Marissa was more than skeptical. She was calling Lucy a liar. This was just a last-ditch effort at getting attention, to make you feel guilty for something that's not your fault. It's not my hair, Tiff. It's red. And I don't have red hair. The roots. You could see silver roots. My hair isn't gray. Not my whole head, anyway. Tiffany shook her head, not accepting any of her reasoning. Marissa took her hand in hers, seeing she was getting upset. Tiff, it was down my throat. I was choking on it in the shower this morning. I can't fake that, and why would I if I could? Lucy, I don't understand what's happening, but I'm leaving now. They started for the door, leaving Lucy in the middle of her defense. Wait, please, don't leave me here alone. I'm scared, she followed, hoping to stop them. Being alone in her apartment after dark was the last thing she wanted. Something bizarre was happening to her, and there was nobody to help her. She could see that her words had hit home by the grimace on Tiffany's face that she still felt something for her. Bye, Lucy. She led Marissa through the door and out into the hallway. Please, Tiff, both of you can stay. Just please don't go. Tears filled Tiffany's eyes as she pursed her lips, tightening her face to hold them in. Please, let this be the end of it. I can't do this again. I won't. Lucy watched them disappear at the end of the hall. She wanted to chase after them, leave with them. Instead, she closed the door and faced her apartment, as she would the coming night alone. The rest of the night was spent binge-watching episode after episode of The Joy of Painting. The beautiful scenes of Bob Ross's gentle tone was relaxing, and for a few minutes she forgot how terrified she was and how much it had hurt to see Tiffany with another woman. An hour past her bedtime, she turned off the light and wrapped herself in the blanket, as though the plush cocoon could protect her. She left the television on, sacrificing her data plan to keep the friendly voice streaming quietly in the background. She gave a final look at her closed bedroom door and covered up her head. 
Happy trees, she thought to herself. Happy trees. Overheated and sweaty, Lucy pulled the blanket off her head. Her t-shirt stuck to her skin and she could feel dampness at the nape of her neck and trickling down her scalp. Her show had stopped streaming due to inactivity and the TV had faded to a darkened screen. She rubbed her face, shifting on the pleather couch to find a position that was cool and comfortable. The light from the screen, even though it was muted, was irritating to her eyes, but she didn't want to be in the dark totally. A deep, wet cough echoed through the silent apartment. Lucy was shocked so completely that her entire body jerked like she had touched a live electric wire. Living in an apartment meant learning to be comfortable with the sounds of other people around her. Footsteps, slamming doors, coughing, sneezing, even loud sex were all things that she had learned to deal with, but this was different. This cough was loud, not muffled by the walls from next door, the floors from below or the ceiling from above. This spongy, mucus-soaked cough was from inside her apartment, from inside her bedroom. She held her breath, hoping that she would not hear anything else, but simultaneously straining to hear even the slightest hint of sound. She could hear nothing but sounds of life from outside, four floors beneath her at street level. The noise from a never-ending river of vehicles, highlighted by the occasional cry of an emergency siren, was constantly in the background of her life. Louder than the ambient roar, but only just, she could hear breathing, labored and muffled from behind her bedroom door. She wasn't dreaming. She didn't imagine it. It was happening. It was real. And she was alone. But, unfortunately, not entirely alone. Another cough, so loud and deep it was just as painful to hear it as well as terrifying. Lucy felt her strength drain out of her body and soak into the couch. She wanted to cry, to scream out for help, but that would alert them. If she made any noise, even breathed too loudly, whoever or whatever was in her apartment would know she had heard them. They would be aware of her. Slowly, she pulled the blanket back over her head, leaving the edge up just high enough that she could partially see the bedroom door. She heard the bed creak, the sound it always made when she got up every morning and covered her mouth with her hands. Tears raced down her cheeks, leaking behind the gaps in her fingers. A moment of silence, and then she heard the bedroom doorknob rattle, attempting to open. Lucy's entire body was trembling, wrapped in her blanket cocoon like a caterpillar in metamorphosis beyond her control. The door slowly opened, but stopped halfway. Passing through the gap and halfway through the door, the figure of an emaciated elderly woman stood silent and whole before her. She was as solid as Lucy, or any inanimate object in the apartment, despite having just walked through the bedroom door. She looked frail, exhausted and ill. Her nightgown hung loosely on her bony frame, her shoulders rounded and her back hunched over. The apparition did not seem to notice Lucy's existence as she shuffled toward the bathroom, almost dragging her bare feet, wheezing and coughing. It took every ounce of courage Lucy could summon not to bolt toward the door and run screaming down the hallway. Part of her wanted to, but most of her was too terrified to consider it. She did not want to draw attention to herself. She did not want her to know she was there. Her mind raced with a thousand questions. Who was she? Why did she linger in her apartment? Why had she only made herself known now? Why didn't she materialize when Tiffany lived there? Her mind raced so quickly, overwhelmed with processing what she'd experienced that a few minutes passed before she realized that the energy in the room had changed and she could no longer hear the dreadful wheezing. The woman had disappeared as completely as she had appeared in the first place. Lucy eventually sat up and huddled into the corner of the couch, still wrapped in her blanket with wide eyes. She did the only thing she could do. She clicked play on the next episode of The Joy of Painting, hoping that the happy, hippie painter's positive vibes would somehow leak out into the area and keep her unwanted house guest at bay. 
The dawn rose, just like any day, as though the sun was unaware of what Lucy had experienced. She watched the bars of light lengthen across the floor as the sun rose higher in the sky. Her eyes hurt, and her neck was sore. As though protected by the power of the sun, Lucy slid from under her blanket and walked as quietly as she could toward the bathroom. It was empty, and nothing had been moved or seemed out of place. It was as though what she had experienced, what she knew she had seen with her own two sober eyes, had not happened at all. But she knew better, and she knew if there were anyone in the entire apartment building who knew the identity of the spirit, it would be Edith. Lucy grabbed a hoodie from the back of the couch and set out in search of answers. Notoriously known as the resident busybody, Edith had lived in the same apartment for 18 years. She had outlasted an unknown number of surrounding residents, as well as three management companies and two building name changes. The only thing living that was older than Edith on the entire property was the stately cedar tree that grew at the front of the building. If anyone knew who the spirit in her apartment might be and what she might want, it would be Edith. Nobody came or went without passing under her eye. No event unnoticed. As much as Lucy hated to admit it, she needed Edith's help. Lucy knocked on Edith's door and crammed her hands into the kangaroo pouch on her hoodie. The night's events had left her chilled to the bone, unable to warm up or fully recover. She had only heard the cough twice, but her mind had replayed it a thousand times. She constantly returned to the memory of watching the otherworldly figure drag past her and disappear into the bathroom. She was so frail, so obviously exhausted, that despite her terror, she felt pity for her. Suddenly the door popped open, overextending the length of the security chain with a jerk, and Edith's wrinkled countenance filled the gap. Lucy's heart leaped out of her chest. She watched Edith's expression change from one of annoyance to morbid curiosity, surprised by her frazzled response. Dear God, what happened to you? Can I come in for a minute? The door closed long enough for Edith's shaking, knobby hand to unlock the chain and then opened again. Once Lucy was inside, she closed and locked the door behind them. Edith's apartment was a time capsule of the 1970s. The sofa, drapes, rugs, and wall art had all been carefully selected on a color chart, ranging from brownish rust up to a warm goldenrod yellow. The air smelled of dry, rotting, sun-baked polyester and mentholated chest salve. Edith studied her, her hands on her wide, drooping hips, her head gently nodding as she tried to figure Lucy out. Would you care for a cup of coffee? She extended the gesture, not knowing what else to do with her. It's not that fancy eight dollars a cup stuff you brew, but it's hot. Yes, thank you, that would be nice. The sarcasm in her voice had not gone unnoticed, but Lucy had expected as much. She watched as Edith waddled to the kitchen and groaned as she reached up to eye level to retrieve coffee cups. I saw Tiffany yesterday she called as she eyeballed the mugs for any spots, wiping them both with a dishcloth. I haven't seen her in ages. Has she been out of town? Tiffany moved out six months ago, Edith. There was the stab Lucy had been waiting for. You watched us load her stuff into the moving van from your window. Oh, yeah, that's right, she dodged, playing the age card horribly, but no less effectively. After a few more minutes and a couple more groans added in to emphasize her point, Edith returned with two cups of coffee, handing her a ceramic mug that had been molded in the shape of an owl, brown and yellow, with large, judgmental, soulless eyes. My old brain isn't what it used to be, you know. How much do you know about the people who have lived in my apartment? Lucy changed the subject abruptly. Some. Her seemingly genuine response shocked Lucy. What do you want to know? Who lived there before I moved in? Well, before you, there was a young couple there, a man and a woman, Edith specified, but they only stayed a couple of months. You know why they left? Not really. Didn't have much to say to anyone. One day they were both here, and then it was just the husband. Never saw the missus again, not even when they were moving out. 
Edith scratched at a long, white hair growing from her chin as she spoke. They were looking to have kids, so I just figured they moved to a larger place, some place with a yard, maybe closer to family. Do you know who lived there before them? Oh, yes, I knew her quite well. Lucy thought she saw a glimmer of compassion in Edith's eyes as she recalled her friend. Her name was Claudia, poor dear. At the end, she suffered so much. Lucy's mind raced with a thousand questions, certain that Edith held the answers to all of them and more, but she refrained. That was Edith's friend, not just some vague idea of a person. She had no way of knowing if the apparition she had witnessed was Claudia or someone else, but either way, she wanted to proceed respectfully. What happened to her? Cancer in her lungs, but it was all over her before she passed. They tried that chemo stuff on her, but it didn't do anything but make her sicker and lose all that hair. Lucy felt her stomach drop to her toes. She thought of her bed, covered in hair that had fallen out. Her blood ran cold in her veins, the coffee cooling in her hands. Why do you ask? I, I was just wondering. You didn't come here just to have a cup of coffee with me. What's the real reason you're here? Edith stated, straightforward. She was too old to fall for such a shallow cover, and Lucy knew it. I saw something, and I can't explain it. What did you see? Lucy swallowed another hard drink of the strong black coffee that now seemed to be eating a hole out in her stomach. She didn't know how to best word it, how to avoid hurting Edith's feelings, so she simply started talking, rambling. I woke up yesterday, and my bed was covered in red hair. Last night I saw an elderly lady. She looked sick, like really sick. She had a really bad cough and was just skin and bones. I saw her walk through my bedroom door and into the bathroom, as solid and real as you and me, and then just disappear. You saw Claudia? I don't know. Maybe. It could have been. I don't know. She tripped over her words fearing her attempts at tact had failed. Edith pulled herself up, groaning as her knees straightened out and shuffled to the bookshelf. She retrieved a gold picture frame and handed it to Lucy. That's Claudia and me at a Christmas luncheon a few years before she got sick. Lucy stared at the woman's face, scarcely able to breathe. The woman she had seen in her apartment was an emaciated version of this woman, a shadow of her. It's her, isn't it? Edith knew the truth, regardless of Lucy's response, which was eventually a silent nod in agreement. She couldn't take her eyes from the picture, could not even blink. Edith could see the young woman's heart beating through her thick sweatshirt. Listen to me, dear. You have nothing to worry about from Claudia. Lucy looked up, her face streaked with tears. She loved that apartment. She was so happy there, right up until the end. I think she would have liked you, maybe liked you better without the blue hair, but still. Edith teased, possibly to help ease Lucy's nerves, but perhaps not. Lucy chose to accept it as a positive with a half-hearted laugh and a sniff. Thank you, Edith, I really appreciate that. The old woman nodded, looking out into the invisible distance. So, if you see her again, tell her I said hello and she still owes me five dollars. The air inside Lucy's apartment felt lighter when she returned. After speaking with Edith and learning all she had about Claudia was encouraging. If this poor woman loved her apartment that much, if she had truly been so happy there, she didn't see why they couldn't find a way to coexist. Perhaps with time her appearance would change to reflect the happier times spent there, instead of its unfortunate end. It didn't seem like such an abstract idea to Lucy, especially when she was already beginning to think of her supernatural houseguest as some sort of roommate. There was no reason why they both could not be happy there. Claudia? she whispered, wondering how loud she should speak for a ghost to hear her. Was she always there, invisible like the oxygen she knew filled the room, or did she come and go? Was there some portal, a place where her apartment was linked to the other side? 
Maybe their unusual arrangement would provide some insight into the mysteries of life after death. I don't know if you can hear me, but if you can, I wanted you to know that Edith told me all about you, and I want you to know that I'm glad you're here. I'm glad this apartment still makes you happy, and you can stay here as long as you like. Lucy looked around at the silent emptiness, the traffic outside, the only sound she could hear. It felt like a burden had been lifted from her, like the pressure in the room had dissipated. She took it as a good sign that Claudia was happy with her. Lucy woke for the first time in bed after having discovered it covered in Claudia's hair. After three nights of sleeping on the couch, a good night's rest had been long overdue. She stretched lazily, unconcerned that she had slept until nearly 11 o'clock. She was just happy not to be covered in her dead roommate's hair. Stepping out of the bedroom and briefly into the living room on her way to the bathroom, Lucy did a double take. The living room door was standing open, the curtains were gone, and the blinds pulled up to the top of the windows. The couch, coffee table, television, bookshelf, nearly everything in the living room had been removed. What the hell? She doubled back into the bedroom to grab her cell phone off the nightstand. Before she could take one step back into the room, Claudia appeared before her. She was solid, human-like. Her gray skin and sunken eye sockets were accentuated by the twigs of stringy red hair that still clung to her scalp. With unexpected strength, Claudia shoved Lucy backward. Get out! This is my house! She growled, a wheeze nearly overtaking her voice. Claudia, it's okay! I live here too! Lucy backpedaled away from the angry spirit. She was more concerned with calming Claudia's wrath than whatever had happened to the furniture. Was that why the door was still standing open? Had the thieves run out in terror before they could take the rest? "'What have you done with my things?' she roared, her voice stronger than Lucy had believed possible. She shuffled toward her just as quickly as Lucy could move backward. "'Nothing. This was my stuff. I don't know who took it. Who are you? Why are you here?' It was clear Claudia was reacting more to her presence than her words. Wait! Lucy sprang to her feet. Please, just wait a minute. Edith will be able to explain everything. Edith? She could tell that her friend's name was still familiar to her, despite the years since her death. She stopped chasing her, looking around the apartment as though she were lost or confused. Yes, Edith, from next door. She made a break for the door. Wait right there. Lucy raced down the hall at top speed, missing furniture now lower on her list of priorities. With Edith's help, maybe Claudia would be able to move on. Maybe the apartment being in such a state of confusion had made her realize that nothing was as she believed it to be. She stopped at Edith's door and knocked loudly and quickly. Hopefully her hard-of-hearing neighbor would be sitting in the living room and not in the kitchen, or worse, in the bathroom. If she delayed, the opportune moment to connect with Claudia might pass, and there was no way of knowing how long it would be before it happened again. Edith yanked the door open with a huff, her wrinkles accentuating the fact that her skin was at least one size too big for her face. Why the hell are you beating my door down? It's Claudia! She's upset! Lucy shuffled back and forth, impatiently waiting for Edith to unlock the safety chain. She opened it just enough for her to squeeze through. Someone broke into my apartment and stole all my stuff. Claudia thinks it's hers and thinks I took it. Can I use your phone? I need to call the police. I can't get past Claudia to get my cell phone. Ugh, you young ones really wear me out. Can never read the writing on the damn wall. Edith shuffled over to her favorite chair and sat down with a flop, her feet bouncing off the floor. What do you mean? Lucy recoiled, insulted by her lack of concern. Have a seat, kid. We need to have a talk, and I'd rather you sit down than fall down. Edith, I don't think you understand. She spoke slowly, as if she was explaining the facts out to a child. Someone broke into my apartment while I was sleeping and stole my stuff. Claudia is losing her mind because she thinks I took her stuff. I don't need to sit down. I need help. Okay, there's no good way to say this, so I'm just going to say it. Honey, you're dead. No, Edith, I'm not dead. Claudia is dead. You feeling okay? 
Don't you remember anything, kid? Every time, it's always the same thing with you young ones. You off yourself or you crash your little smart car to smithereens and then you come back here like nothing happened. You walk around lost for a few days and then when you start to notice the others, you lose your crap like you're the one that's being haunted. If anyone should be running around here screaming, it's me. Edith's apartment spun around Lucy in a swirl of yellow and dark wood veneer. Her head felt light, her face hot. She realized she could not remember how many days had passed since she had last gone to work. When had she last eaten? The last thing she could remember was the last day she was at work. Double shift, the table under the light of the street lamp. Tiffany, too much to drink, can't sleep, sleeping pills in the bathroom cabinet. No, you're wrong. I found Claudia's hair in my bed. I talked to Tiffany. I'm talking to you now. I'm not dead. Think back to Tiffany's visit. Did she talk to you or at you? Did she answer a direct question? Make eye contact? Tiffany and Marissa's visit flashed through her mind. She had not answered her call or understood her voicemail and didn't knock when she arrived. She had not touched her or looked her in the eye or even ask if she could have the strip of pictures from the mirror. She didn't think much about it at the time. The situation was already so strange, but Marissa had not even acknowledged her presence. Why would Tiffany bring her there in the first place? It wasn't like her to strike out in an attempt to hurt her. Tiffany had never tried to hurt her. She would never have brought Marissa into her home knowing she would be there. Tiffany knew she would not be there. She knew she was dead. Lucy grabbed the sides of her head, crumbling down into a ball under the weight of Edith's words. It was too much. She could not accept it. She would not accept it. I didn't mean to. I don't think this, this can't be happening. I don't want to die. Not die, honey. Dead. Past tense. Lucy broke into wailing sobs, bawling up on Edith's couch. She wanted her to be wrong. She wanted to wake up from her nightmare. She wanted to go back in time, back to the day she cut her hair, passing smiling faces on the street. Okay, so I can see you're not taking this very well, so let me try to explain to you in a way your little hipster brain might understand. Back in the day, we had boxes that sat on our TVs, and you could tune in channels that you didn't pay for. Sometimes the picture was just scrambled, blended with the channel beside it. It was right there, but both pictures would overlap and you couldn't make any sense out of either one. That's what's happening with you and Claudia. You see, she can't accept it either. That she's dead and that's not her apartment anymore. And neither can you, so your channels are scrambled together. She's watching pieces of your show and you're seeing pieces of hers. What about you then? How come you can see me and, and Tiffany couldn't? Well, sometimes, if you were really careful, you could tune your TV just right and you could see that scrambled channel. Your show or movie would be just as clear as if you were meant to see. Maybe even get to watch something your parents didn't want you to see. Something you weren't supposed to see. Do you think it's an accident? that you spirits keep showing up at my door? Do you think I like living in eternal 1975? No, I'm sick of yellow. But I keep it the same because it's familiar to your little ghost brains. Everything around here changes but me and this apartment. That's what brings you back here to me instead of roaming the halls, scaring kids, and aggravating my neighbor's little chihuahua. God, it pisses me off when you guys do that. Get that big rat to yapping. You need to tell the others to cut that stuff out. I'm too old for all that noise. What do I do now? How do I move on? Everything I love is here. There's nobody waiting for me. She wiped her face on her sleeves, her mind beginning to accept what her heart already knew. For starters, you've got to let go of Tiffany. You have to accept that she's alive and you're dead by your own doings." She pointed her finger at her, 
accenting her words in a no-nonsense type of way, Lucy felt like she was being scolded by a parent again. You have to settle up with yourself on that. Nothing I can say to help you there. But what I can tell you is that you have to cut ties, kid. This life's not for you anymore. What if I can't? Then you'll stay here, or wherever it is that you decide to haunt, but don't even consider trying to find Tiffany. Even if you do, that will just make you and her miserable. You understand? You leave that girl alone. Let her live. Can I stay here? Hell no. I'm 84 years old. I might die in my sleep tonight, and I don't want the first thing I see to be you moping around in my apartment, getting my ghost brain all confused like yours. Edith peered down her bifocals that sat on the end of her nose, inspecting the buttons on her TV remote. Now, get on out of here. My soaps come on in 15 minutes. Lucy walked slowly back to her apartment, unsure of what to do next. How could everything be so different and still look the same? The door to her apartment was still open and she turned to walk in. She could see moving men carrying her mattress toward the door. Unlike willfully using her cell phone or holding Edith's coffee cup, she simply sighed and allowed it to pass right through her effortlessly, like she wasn't even there. Like most of the living, they could not see her, but a shimmer of warmth on her side and arm from one of the men's hands passing through her presence highlighted the interaction of the living world and spirit world. The energy of his life was electric and hot, and she wonders what he'd felt, or if he had felt anything at all. Had he experienced the infamous cold spot that all the paranormal researchers had claimed to be the presence of a spirit? As she walked toward the window, standing in the empty room, Claudia shuffled up beside her. The paranormal was normal now. Death was now life. As she looked out into the bright sun, she could still feel the warmth through the glass. The river of vehicles still flowed. The sirens still called out. Her life had ended, but life had not. It all still sounded the same, looked the same. Everything but her. Thanks for listening. If you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. All stories used in Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find links to the authors, stories, and sources I used in the episode description, as well as on the website at WeirdDarkness.com. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find information on sponsors you heard during the show, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, find other podcasts that I host. You can visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. And if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell of your own, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Weird Darkness is a registered trademark. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness. <laughs>